Hi. I'm Anna. I'm the one who's been emailing you. Hi, Anna. Media, you? obviously. <laughs> Can you tell me how to pronounce your last name properly? Che. Che. Okay. Very nice to meet you in person. Nice to meet you. Um, in kind you, of person. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kind, I say in person. This is like the new in person, I guess, for a lot of people, but um we usually give it until about five after if that's okay while people kind of shuffle in after their patients are finishing up yeah uh, no problem but i'm happy to see if your slides are are sharing appropriately whenever you are ready sure um so sometimes i have an issue because what it'll do is it'll share like Oh, I see already. Uh, what's going on? Yeah, so I see your slides, screen? but it's. Yeah. Oh, that's right. I didn't ask it to do slideshow yet, dummy. <laughs> um, I'm start. Yeah, that looks you... great. Oh, okay, great. That looks great. So, yep, I'll just give it um, maybe about seven, eight minutes and see who shuffles in. Okay. Thank oh, you. That's really weird. Why is my, my name's funny? As an extra R. <laughs> oh. Whoops. Okay. Go off, then I can see everybody. Um, Anna, oh, that's not what I meant to do. Sorry. Um, what uh, typically is the mix of people that we great question that, so we'll have a lot of residents um okay. child neurology and some adult neurology as they're able to join us and then uh child neurology faculty and nurse practitioners okay and how many typically join um typically about 20 so sometimes it's a little mm -hmm. misleading with the the screens because sometimes there's like crowds of people and oh I see, locations yeah. <laughs> so a lot of times it's more than it appears um but you typically at least 20 by the time you count everybody up. And how many residents do you have in your program? So we uh, do kids. Sure. We do two a year. Well, we did two a year for PGY fives and fours, and then we're on to three a year. Oh, okay. So you just so, increased your complement. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. nice. So we have three in the in PGY one through three classes. And we'll continue okay. on with three from here. And um, I'm sorry, my uh <laughs> Just so you know, and I'll say this also, my my toddler and my in-laws are in my house with me, oh, although they're outside right now, and I have two big dogs that are like, I don't know what they're barking at. <laughs> We're very pet friendly. We always have, I think, pet appearances from people at, at home <laughs> on our lectures, so. I have my headphones in, so hopefully that limits like what kind of, like how much of the background you guys hear. Um, and do you cover multiple hospitals as well? Um, we really just one. There's a few other outlying, um, like there's one other location of this hospital that has a NICU, mm -hmm. um, but, and the residents don't go there. The attendings will cover that NICU. Um, and there's a NICU at University Hospital, which is down the street that we'll cover. Um, but those are kind of pale in comparison volume wise compared to Norton Children's Hospital, which is our, you know, main location. Now, and when we do our adult year, we go to University of Louisville Hospital. Okay. Which also covers Jewish Hospital, but that's, they just merge. Lots of like merging and kind of organizational changes have happened over the past few years, especially on the adult side, but... And do you ever have an opportunity to work with Dr. Seifer, Chad Seifer, in that headache is medicine? so familiar. Is he with Norton? Mm -hmm. I think so. You know what? I haven't, but there's, um, we'll see if Paul Gong should be on here shortly. He's one of the PGY4s who's very, who's planning to do headache. Um, hmm. So he, and he has worked with a lot of the adult Norton uh, people. So I'm, I wouldn't be surprised at all if he has. He has worked with... Um, Oh, what is the other name of their adult person? Oh, if he still say it, but there's a, at least one or two other adult providers I know he's worked with, but. Dr. Plato.
Anna, I think someone said Dr. Plato. Like Dr. Plato, that's it. <laughs> I'm like, a, I'm definitely a face person. So I, I have trouble remembering names sometimes if I don't like know the person. But it's, yes, Brian Plato is the other kind of major adult player. Within and the I know, system. yeah, I know Tad really well because we do concussion work together. Nice. So um, that's how I know him. But so I'm not, I'm not really like a headache person. Like I really am trained in sports neuro neurotrauma. That's really cool. You don't have I'll, enough of this. <laughs> I'll give a brief. <laughs> like That'd be what awesome. Happened, yeah, it's a happened to my career. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear more about it. Um, did you do a spit? Well, I'll just wait. I'll listen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's Paul gone. You said he was the one going into headache, right? Yes, he is the one going into headache. Hey, Paul, can you hear us? Yes, sorry, I'm in the cafeteria. Oh, no, that's okay. Um, Dr. Cho was wondering if you've worked with Dr. Seifert on the adult side. Yes, I have. Uh, I did a month with the uh, adult neuro headache people, and uh, he was one. I did his concussion clinic with him. Nice. I was telling Anna that Tad is uh, one of my colleagues in concussion. So, oh, cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Oh, Anna was saying that you guys are very pet friendly. If my dogs were littler, I could pick them up and show them to you. And I also have horses as pets, so. Ooh, what kind but, of dog do you have? Uh, they're mutts. Uh, <laughs> they are just mixed breeds that I got from um, shelters. Uh, I don't know. I don't. Um, like I personally have not bought a purebred. Um, that's just my preference. Yeah, they're, I think they're a little more common over here, but <laughs> yeah. Can... Are your dogs big? Are, say, are they? Are your dogs very large? They are. I can show you. Um, so isn't this the benefit of Zoom, right? Here's one, that's Aww. Percy. And then here's, here's the other one, Flurry. <laughs> that's <laughs> Hannah. Cute. Uh, Do your horses live like at your house or your- So they... one of them lives at my parents' house, which is five minutes away. And then the other one lives uh, at my trainers in Thousand Oaks, which is 45 minutes away. And I am going to go riding after we do your, your noon conference, my nine o'clock meeting. Um, so I have riding pants on on the bottom <laughs> and I look professional on top. <laughs> yeah. It's the benefit of Zoom, right? You can like get half dressed. My um, my horse that lives at home is a thoroughbred off the track that I'm trying to retrain. You're also speaking our language for the people who are from Kentucky. We uh, yep. love our horses here, that's for sure. <laughs> I will show you that one. He's very cuddly. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> so cute that's like the most cuddly I've ever seen a horse be I think I mean oh, he's not experienced but <laughs> yeah he's 
kind of ridiculous. <laughs> because I think when you, you know, like they're in your backyard, yeah. uh, they tend to become pets like your dogs. So that's awesome. Well, I think we can go ahead and get started. If you are ready, I think we have a good crowd and people will continue to migrate as they can. Sure. Um, so everybody, this is Dr. Cha. She's joining us from UCLA. It's um, breakfast time at her house, I think, and our lunch time. So really grateful she was able to speak with us today. She is an expert in concussion medicine and neurology and child neurology specifically, um, and also has an interest in dysautonomy and POTS, which is something that I feel like we frequently see and can be quite challenging. Um, so I think really excited to hear her talk and she's going to tell us a little bit more about her training because we also don't hear a ton about sports medicine training and neurology. So welcome, Dr. Cha. Thank you so much. Thank, for thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I'm really excited to uh, venture out into the world of <laughs> the rest of the country and give talks, although this one's uh, via Zoom, so I didn't even have to leave the comfort of my own home. Um, but I, I did want to share a little bit about how I got into POTS, which um, can give you some background about my training. I'm a child neurologist. Uh, I started my residency in 2004, and in the middle of my residency, I decided that I wanted to do some basic science research. So I added three years of no clinical time, so uh, just basic science research. And that was in brain tumor stem cells, and we don't see a lot of brain tumors at UCLA uh, in the pediatric population. I, a lot of the work that I was doing was on GBM, which as you guys know, is not very common in, in the pediatric population. So it didn't like really match clinically. So I was having a hard time. I can't, I can't bounce back and forth like that. It didn't have as much meaning to me as something that I would be seeing clinically. And um, during this time, and actually since I graduated college, I, I was coaching swimming and uh, I do also the equestrian team at the high school where I graduated from which I graduated and uh, the athletic trainer at the high school was setting up a meeting for concussion a concussion program starting a concussion program and this was uh, maybe in 2010 um, so just like right at the beginning of when concussions were really kind of exploding in terms of of knowledge and awareness um, in the school sports that child uh, age kind of um, and uh, he was setting that meeting up with my now um, colleague mentor, uh, Chris Giza, who, um, if you guys have read concussion papers, he read, he wrote with Jeff Kutcher the A and guidelines on concussion. And that was uh, published, I guess, about eight years ago, I think maybe in 2000, I think it was 2013. So um, when I went to that meeting, Chris asked me, oh, are you interested in concussion? And at this point, I was, I think, in my fifth year of residency, so my eighth year total. Um, and I said, oh, well, I've had concussions. So I've already told you that I ride horses. Uh, I'm an equestrian um, and uh, you know, you, you fall, it's a high risk sport. Um, uh, and, uh, and so I said, so I've had them, I, I know about them. And he said, well, we have a database, you know, please query the database. If you have a question you wanna ask and you can submit um, a, an abstract to AAN. Uh, that year, and that year uh, was in New Orleans. Um, and so I said, okay, I'll, I'll do that. And I put together an abstract, it was accepted, and I went to New Orleans. And if any of you have been to AAN, uh, they have sections, uh, for those of you who have not been actually, they have sections in AAN, uh, and um, they have like an in-person meeting at AAN, so you can go to your like uh, section of headache or child neurology or educators, women, uh, in neurology has a group there. And then uh, they had sports neurology. So I went with Chris to the sports neurology section. I never met any of these people. And in the room were a whole bunch of people that I'd read their papers. Um, there were about 50 people in the room, 45 of whom were men, um, probably about uh, the same number of them were, were white. Uh, and, but yet I walked into the room and after an hour, I was like, oh, that was my aha moment. Like, this is where I belong. Um, and, uh, I hadn't had that feeling before, you know, at UCLA, we specialize in epilepsy. We have a lot of epilepsy surgery. We have eight epileptologists. Um, so we do a lot of work there and I thought, okay, I can, you know, like, that seems kind of fun. I like reading EEGs. That's interesting. Um, but when I, when I went to sports, I was like, oh, so I made my own fellowship. I'm one of the first two graduates, um, in the country. The other one is, uh, Andrea Almeida, who's up at the university of Michigan as faculty now. 
Um, interestingly, we were both women. And I think actually in our field, uh, the people who have completed sports neurology fellowship programs, and there are about 10 in the country, um, the people who have completed them are, are about half women, um, which I think is interesting. Not very many pediatric neurologists. And so uh, there are three of us that are formally trained in sports neurology. One is Sean Rose over at Ohio. Um, and then uh, the other one is Rachel Pearson, who we trained at UCLA, and she's down at uh, Children's Hospital of Orange County. So that's how I got into concussion. So I did a two-year fellowship. Um, and uh, as Anna mentioned, I'm going to talk to you today about autonomic dysfunction and, and POTS. So um, Anna and I were talking about what would be the, the best topic to cover, and I could easily have done either, but uh, she mentioned you guys see a lot of POTS and it is it is somewhat of a more complicated um, thing that we see, I think, as child neurologists. And there's a lot of like heterogeneity, which makes it um, difficult to diagnose and then treat. And so uh, we thought we would um, cover this today. So I'm gonna share my slides. And please feel free to like jump in and ask questions. I'm you know, I practice in LA, we're very informal. Uh, and my chief, my division chief, butts in all the time. So I'm used to people kind of um, talking while I talk. Uh, no, sorry, I did the wrong thing. Uh, oh no, how did I, how do I go back? Oh, slideshow, sorry. Um, and then, and Anna, just thumbs up. Okay, perfect. Okay, so um, we're not gonna talk a, a ton about other types of autonomic dysfunction, but I am gonna cover POTS and I'll just mention that there are a few others that we see in our clinic. Um, and so basically what I want you to learn today, POTS is multifactorial in etiology uh, and we'll cover those different um, kinds of reasons that we see POTS uh, pop up in our population. Autonomic function testing can help us to identify the type of autonomic dysfunction. Um, and then, oops, POTS requires a multidisciplinary approach to treatment. And so I've kind of told you already my background in TBI, and this was an abstract I submitted now seven years ago to National Neurotrauma Society. And um, we, in our POTS, uh, sorry, in our TBI clinic, we do orthostatic vital signs. And what we were seeing was that about 20 to 30 percent, you know, we've gone, we've kind of updated our numbers. Um, and that's, uh, that is in a under review publication right now. But about 20 to 30 percent have orthostatic tachycardia after their TBI. And so the reason that I fell into the POTS clinic that we have at UCLA is because of my experience with uh, TBI headache, and then having seen some of the orthostatic tachycardia. Um, at UCLA, we have a multidisciplinary clinic. Uh, it is uh, cardiology, rheumatology, and um, uh, neurology on the same day. And then we have an easy referral uh, kind of pathway to GI. And in my concussion clinic, I have an occupational therapy team and dietitian. And I'll tell you a little bit later on how I utilize those people as well. So I borrow my resources a lot. Uh, so it probably doesn't surprise you to learn that there really isn't much literature in POTS. And the reason is that although it's been obviously around for a very long period of time, it really wasn't described until the 90s. Um, and so we've, we've got a very limited kind of perspective of you know, tracking uh, the people that we um, see with POTS. Um, and in fact, there aren't any longitudinal studies. And I, I learned this because I was just doing a med legal case on someone who had developed POTS and they wanted to kind of um, prognosticate about <laughs> what would happen in the future. And there's nothing um, that we can base kind of what we're saying on because there's really no, no studies that have followed people. It's uh, a lot of cross-sectional studies um, or uh, observational studies. Uh, it's a pretty large percentage of the population. I think 1% is pretty big because that means that, you know, a million, couple million people might suffer from, from POTS. Uh, the age of presentation, and this is important for us as child neurologists, is from 15 to 50. And really, this is kind of the age at which they're diagnosed. Um, I've seen kids, you know, down in the single digits that have uh, POTS-like symptoms. Um, and 
they're fortunate they come to us a little bit early uh, and they get recognized earlier. Um, I'll show you some data in a paper later that has um, the statistic, it, it takes many years for most people to get uh, diagnosed. Um, oftentimes there are other overlapping autonomic dysfunctions like neurocardiogenic syncope, pure autonomic failure, orthostatic hypotension, or inappropriate sinus tachycardia. I think the one that we see most commonly in our clinic is the inappropriate sinus tachycardia. Um, the pathophysiology is pretty heterogeneous and not actually super well understood. There's a neuropathic component, which is impaired sympathetically mediated vasoconstriction in the lower extremities. Um, you have the excessive cardiac sympatho excitatory response, the hyperadrenergic response. Um, and then there's some volume dysregulation and physical deconditioning, which probably plays a role. Um, if you've seen these uh, patients in your clinic, you know it starts around puberty. Um, in the populations that have been studied, it seems to be more common in Caucasians, but it's really hard to know because we don't know if we're just not getting um, other ethnicities um, uh, coming to clinic. Um, you know, we know, you know, over the last, I think, three or four years, we've seen a little bit more in terms of the literature on uh, access to care. And we know that other um, ethnic groups do not, uh, racial and ethnic groups do not come to the doctor as much as, or, or utilize healthcare as much as um, Caucasians do. Um, interestingly, 15% have an affected relative. So this suggests that there's some kind of genetic predisposition. Um, you know, I, we see in our clinic plenty of people whose parents either have similar symptoms or who have a sibling or a cousin with, uh, with POTS as well. And um, in addition to POTS, we do see that there is, an, uh, there is a higher prevalence of autoimmune disorder in a family member. Um, other features of of people who have POTS, you know, there's hyperextensibility. This is why we have our rheumatologist. Uh, so the hyperextensible type uh, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, um, we see commonly. Uh, and, you know, when you think about it, this makes sense because people who have kind of flexi soft tissues, and this is how I explain it to, to the teens too. Uh, you know, you have really kind of lax soft tissues. Um, and when you vasodilate, your vessels don't have the ability to kind of come back together and compress again. And so you get a lot of venous pooling when you stand up. Um, and this is actually uh, helps us to explain, you know, what the treatments are for, for teens. Cause oftentimes I'm trying to get them to exercise um, and they don't really want to. And if I explain the mechanism, then, then sometimes they're more, um, eager to do it. Interestingly, there is a, some psychological component, um, there seem to be a lot of high achievers uh, that um, get POTS, uh, and we don't know why this is. Maybe it's due to a hyperstimulated nervous system. Um, oftentimes, we, this is precipitated, the onset of POTS might be precipitated by kind of a typical immunologic stressor. In about a half or so, we see um, that there might be an antecedent viral syndrome, usually URI or GI is, are, are the kind of more common. Um, there may be physical trauma, and I think there may be psychological trauma that can also precipitate this, although, you know, that's just based on my kind of seeing in clinic. Um, menarche in girls, pregnancy in, in females, sorry, and then surgery is another uh, sometimes trigger for POTS. Um, I've had also a few eating disorders um, that trigger POTS. Uh, so that's another thing that I would say, you know, can occur. Uh, typically occurs in females more than males. Uh, in the adult population, the skew is 90% female to male. And in adolescence, it's about 50% to two thirds. And then they come with a whole bunch of kinds of symptoms that uh, might be associated. So dizziness, obviously. Um, headache, which is why they get referred to us quite commonly. Uh, and then brain fog is the other big neurologic symptom that they complain about. Then there is, you know, uh, temperature instability, uh, altered sensation to temperature, a lot of abdominal symptoms um, occur. Uh, and so what's the definition of POTS? So uh, 
recently, actually, just this last year, this um, paper was published, um, and it was a consensus uh, statement from a group that met together to kind of better describe POTS and then talk about treatments that work and then research that is necessary. And so it's defined as a complex multi-system chronic disorder of the autonomic nervous system characterized by orthostatic intolerance with excessive heart rate increase and symptoms on standing while blood pressure is maintained and the orthostatic symptoms improve after return to supine position. The criteria um, that have been um, kind of defined by multiple groups, multi-multidisciplinary groups, um, are that you have to have a sustained heart rate increase of not less than 30 beats per minute within 10 minutes of standing or head up tilt. And in our population that we see in our clinics, so for you, you guys and, and me, um, in adolescence, the required heart rate increment is greater than 40 beats per minute. There is a little bit of controversy. So the kind of standing um, definition has been 40 beats per minute, but I've seen plenty of kids and there are there is some literature out there that uh, between 30 and 40 with symptoms, those, those tend to either progress into kind of more severe form of POTS or they could just be maintained at that mild, um, uh, you know, in that mild kind of category. And then we end up treating them the same, regardless of whether they meet this 40 beats per minute criteria. There is no definition for less than 12. Um, an absence of orthostatic hypotension, frequent symptoms of orthostatic intolerance during standing. Um, and so, you know, these are the most frequent. So a lightheadedness, oftentimes they'll say dizziness. And if you ask them really to uh, kind of describe that dizziness. It really more, is more like a presyncopal feeling. Um, and duration of symptoms for at least three months. You know, not surprisingly, most of these people have had symptoms for a long time by the time they get to a clinic that diagnoses them. Uh, and then absence of other conditions that explain sinus tachycardia. I don't necessarily agree with this severe deconditioning thing because I think severe deconditioning is not something um, that you can rapidly improve with treatment. Uh, and uh, so there, there are POTS types of symptoms tend to be more chronic as opposed to, you know, if they have some one of these other things, uh, it's almost like you can treat them pretty rapidly and uh, they, they'll improve right away. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, POTS, is, so this is based on a, a POTS, uh, a cross-sectional survey that, that was conducted in POTS patients, and it was online, community-based, um, and they had all been diagnosed with POTS. So this wasn't just like you had suspected POTS. Uh, and the final analysis included almost um, 5,000 participants, uh, and really was very skewed in the population. So over 90% of them were white females of child childbearing age. Um, almost 50% of them had developed their symptoms in adolescence. Uh, so I think, um, in another uh, figure, it's a, it was around 14 years of age. Um, but uh, you can see that almost, you know, very many, a large majority of them were misdiagnosed prior to their POTS diagnosis. And you can see here in this diagnostic delay um, uh, graph that uh, the median um, wait time to in it from initial presentation to diagnosis was two years. But you can see out here, there's like a large kind of uh, um, large minority, it's 15% of patients that had been almost 10 years, 10 years or more um, between presentation and diagnosis. So uh, the mean was 4.9 plus or minus seven years. So some patients did have very long wait times. Uh, females waited nearly two years longer than males for a POTS diagnosis. Um, so that indicates that there may be some gender bias influencing the diagnostic process. And you can see we're, we're getting a little bit better, you know, now as we learn more about POTS. Um, so that's good. We've gone from three, uh, from oh, five, six years, uh, and now we're maybe down around four. Um, so the signs and symptoms, we've kind of gone over these, but the orthostatic intolerance and result of cerebral hypoperfusion, you get these sets of symptoms up here. Um, and then uh, it's important to kind of acknowledge that you can get some symptoms related to sympathoexcitation. So 
um, palpitations. A lot of patients have these things, palpitations, chest pain, shortness of breath. Uh, they have a lot of GI symptoms. Um, and then they may get some of these other things. Tremulousness is something that a lot of the patients complain to me about. Um, not a large, so not a majority of them have vasovagal syncope, but it is a large minority. Um, but oftentimes they're describing presyncopal um, feelings. Um, and then the symptoms are typically exacerbated by things like heat, which in LA, we, we see a lot of this in the summer. They're, they're, they get much, much worse. Um, they have exercise intolerance. Uh, heavy meals can exacerbate their symptoms, um, hence the use of my dietitian. Uh, and then if they stay in bed a long period of time, which many of them are because they're very symp um, symptomatic, uh, menses can, and then obviously these medications. And we have seen some patients, a few, uh, that have cyclical um, kind of uh, episodes. So um, I have some patients that, you know, at certain times of years or certain seasons, they will have kind of an eruption of all of their symptoms, and then they go away for a certain period of time. Um, so I mentioned a little bit that there is some kind of poorly understood, uh, portion of this that, um, that may be really, or, or that, uh, is a portion of patients that have some mental health issues and primarily it's an anxiety, uh, or panic issue. Um, and this may be, you know, like maybe they're hypervigilant types of people to begin with, but we really don't understand um, the pathophysiology of why mental health and especially the uh, anxiety is, is a component. Now, there may be abnormal processing of viscerosensory information and, uh, and they, you know, this may get conditioned in a certain patient and then um, they, uh, they may just respond to changes in heart rate uh, differently. Um, you know, I mentioned the hypervigilance. Um, they tend to have poor sleep uh, and you know, they may, this is another thing that may exacerbate their, uh, kind of the, the physiology, um, of it. Uh, this was a study that, um, Dr. Cutsworth Gregory, or sorry, this, um, was taken from, uh, a study that Dr. Cutsworth Gregory, did, uh, or a review that Dr. Cutsworth Gregory refers to. Um, he is an autonomic disorder specialist, a neurologist who's an autonomic disorder specialist, um, and uh, works at the Mayo Clinic. So this was 150 patients um, at the, in the Mayo Clinic's um, experience. And you can see what the frequency of symptoms presentation is here, um, or uh, you know, what the, the patients had at, at, at presentation. So you know, we talked about lightheadedness or dizziness, um, and then uh, palpitations, presyncope is very common. Um, and then the non-orthostatic symptoms. So fatigue, very, very common. Um, migraine is a lot of what we see. Uh, and I think this number is actually much, much higher. Um, so we've talked a little bit, oh, whoops. Um, we talked a little bit about the physiology of, of what's happening. So basically when you're laying down, a quarter of your blood volume is in your thorax. And when you stand up, you know, a, a lot of it shifts down to your lower extremities um, and, and into the interstitial space. Uh, now, these patients, as I mentioned, have, you know, oftentimes impaired venous return that might be due to some dysfunction of their blood vessels. Um, so that impaired venous return to the heart uh, results in reduced cardiac filling uh, and reduced stroke volume, blood pressure. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's some uh, bare receptors in the carotid sinus and aortic arch, and they stimulate the sympathetic uh, efferent nerve activity and suppress the parasympathetic activity. So there you get that imbalance of sympathetic to parasympathetic. Um, and so those are, are the systems that are, that are involved. Um, and so when you kind of look more closely at some of the, the symptoms and the pathophysiology of why those symptoms occur. Um, you know, here over on the left side, we have parasympathetic, which, you know, basically decreases, uh, like you feel kind of resting and then the sympathetic, you're like amped up. Um, so, you know, orthostatic intolerance is, is probably due to the sympathetic activation and parasympathetic withdrawal. Um, you know, the, the tachycardia that we, we see as a result of hypersensitivity to norepinephrine, 
um, a hypovagal response. And I, I thought this was interesting. Um, it's kind of an older paper, but I don't think we, we've learned much more from, from this, uh, sorry, since that time. Um, and I, I like this because it, it actually includes more areas of the brain than, than I typically see in the POTS papers um, to explain some of the, uh, at least, you know, here are the, some of the psychological things that we see. Um, and so, you know, the mechanisms of orthostatic intolerance in POTS includes an impaired sympathetic uh, vasoconstriction, um, and that leads to venous pooling down here, um, deconditioning plays a role, uh, and a hyperadrenergic state plays a role. And this excessive reflex sympatho excitation may be triggered by orthostatic stress here uh, via reduced baroceptor input to the nucleus of the, um, nucleus of the solitary tract. And then activation of the vestibulosympathetic reflexes relayed via the medial vestibular nucleus uh, here, oh, sorry, here to here, um, result, uh, uh, result in increased activity of the sympathetic excitatory neurons of the rostral ventrolateral medial, medulla, sorry. Um, and then all of this is really abnormally processed um, information that gets relayed through, again, the nucleus of the solitary tract, via um, and then through the ventromedial thalamus uh, with the outputs through here. Um, and then you see these uh, psychological kind of components of POTS that we see. And, and I mentioned that because as the neurologist in the, <laughs> the POTS clinic um, and with limited resources in mental health for children, I end up managing a lot of the, the anxiety components um, or the, the psychological and mental health uh, things that we see that go along with POTS. Um, you know, kind of a, a funny story is that, um, you know, we have uh, blocked out for our clinics hour for new patient and a half hour for a return. When we first started our clinic, um, so they come and they spend three hours. So they, they see the cardiologist and myself, the neurologist, and then the rheumatologist. Um, and I was talking with the cardiologist and I said, this is really not enough time for me. Like this hour is just you know, as you know, some, some neurology patients can take a long time, um, especially if they've been undiagnosed for a long time. And uh, he was finishing up things in, in half an hour. So he wasn't using his full hour, which is great because then I could just jump in early if I was free. Um, and when we would discuss the patients together, I would talk about you know, a lot of the psychological anxiety, you know, things that were popping up in our patients. And he would say, oh, I didn't, I didn't get that information. And I said, you're the cardiologist, you're not asking, but I'm the brain doctor. So they're, you know, telling me about all of the brain things, uh, which includes the, the mental health component. Um, so I mentioned a little bit that, you know, like there, there may be different um, kind of uh, presentations of POTS and this might be due to, uh, you know, the, the basic pathophysiology in each patient. So um, we talk about a neuropathic type of POTS um, which we think may be due to a regional partial sympathetic denervation and adrenergic hypo, hypo activity. Um, in these patients, we see uh, a small fiber neuropathy, um, especially down in the lower extremities. Uh, there's, um, there is some, but rare instances of like an autoimmune autonomic neuropathy um, uh, that falls probably into this bucket. Um, they do have pseudomotor impairment. So typically on their, um, uh, their sweat tests, they will have down here, you can see distally in the foot compared to proximal leg and distal leg where it's normal, the sweat response is decreased. Um, and they often have GI complaints. Uh, then there's the hyperadrenergic POTS, which is the low flow. Um, and so in this case, uh, this is due to excessive sympathetic tone. Um, and so when a patient goes upright, so from like either active standing or head up tilt, uh, they have an initial decrease of cerebral blood flow and then have these symptoms related to that kind of decrease in cerebral blood flow. Um, there is a primary versus secondary uh, hype type of hyperadrenergic POTS. Um, and the secondary seems to be pretty heterogeneous. 
uh, and then the primary is related to having high plasma norepinephrine. Um, and so you can, they most likely have um, a genetic mutation here um, and have a deficient norepinephrine transporter protein. Uh, this type of POTS, the hyperadrenergic POTS, is more often associated with mast cell activation syndrome. And so you'll see these symptoms that are um, common in, in MCAS. Uh, and these are, you know, down here, I've listed the, the symptoms that they typically experience and um, mention. Um, during Valsalva, so on their autonomic testing, when you're doing your diagnostic workup, um, on their Valsalva, you can see that they have a big blood pressure overshoot um, during phase four, um, or they have fluctuating blood pressure or a hypertensive re response during head up table testing. And then hypovolemic POTS, uh, this may be due to an impaired renin angiotensin aldosterone system um, and resulting decreased blood volume, which then creates reduced preload. Uh, back to the heart. Um, and then there's also bed rest POTS or deconditioning. So I mentioned earlier that it's, a, I don't necessarily agree that deconditioning is not a pathophysiological um, issue in POTS, like that that should be excluded. I think that deconditioning should be included in, in the POTS uh, as, a, as a reason for patients uh, having POTS. Um, so I'm actually gonna skip that one. And so let's start talking about um, what we see in um, our patients. So, you know, it's a lot of overlapping kinds of symptoms. Um, and this is very similar. Uh, if I come back at some point and talk about concussion and invite me back, um, then um, you'll see it's, it's very kind of heterogeneous group of symptoms, non-specific, uh, you know, teenagers will complain of lack of concentration anyway, or being fatigued, um, or they need more sleep, uh, or they're stressed. So these are, you know, things that occur in POTS, but occur in a lot of other, other things as well. Um, here are the, the frequent um, comorbidities that were seen in that survey study that I mentioned earlier. Um, and you can see that most commonly, patients complain of migraine, which is why we see them. Uh, then they have some symptoms of IBS. Uh, I mentioned Ehlers-Danlos as probably one of the pathophysiological components. Um, and then a lot of them report chronic fatigue. So chronic fatigue and migraine are typically the things that I am most responsible for uh, in our multidisciplinary clinic. Then the rheumatologists manage the autoimmune uh, and the fibromyalgia, brain odds, um, and then the cardiologist manages, you know, the, the tachycardia and the IST. Um, so that study showed just 40%, but really two thirds, um, up to two thirds can complain of chronic daily headache with dizziness. Uh, they're really difficult to treat, um, mostly because uh, they, it's very difficult to eliminate the tachycardia and most of their headaches are being derived from the tachycardia. So you're just trying to give them symptomatic management um, and, tr and trying to give them some behavioral recommendations. So headaches are often aggravated by standing and they are relieved by rest. Um, they, a lot of them have chronic pain and there may be some uh, indication in some of these patients that they have kind of a central sensitization issue. Um, I did mention EDS, uh, so this is where a lot of them have some joint pain as well, joint and mu uh, musculoskeletal pain. Um, EDS3 is the non-genetic type of uh, EDS. See, there's no gene test for the hyperextensible type of POTS, so it's a clinical diagnosis solely. Um, and a lot of these patients will report chronic pain kind of here in these areas most commonly. Chronic fatigue is another thing that I often um, get reported to me. Uh, and, you know, they have either it's persistent or it's relapsing and chronic. Uh, they don't exactly remember when it, it started, but it's usually kind of a slowly progressive. They get more and more tired um, and it's a substantial reduction in previous baseline function. They can have um, other things that are associated. They might have um, some physical symptoms like sore throat or lymphadenopathy, 
they oftentimes have non-restorative sleep, um, memory impairments. As you know, that's probably multifactorial. Uh, so again, this may occur kind of post-infectiously, um, you know, chronic fatigue on its own if it, if it wasn't associated with POTS, um, but also in our POTS patients occurs post-infectiously. Uh, and then, you know, is associated obviously in the POTS patients with a higher resting heart rate. Um, but because they have this higher blood pressure as well, we think that it's probably a sympathetic overactivity in their case. So they have the hyperadrenergic type of POTS. Um, so why, why is sleep important? And a lot of things that I do as a neurologist is try to help them with their sleep um, improvement. Uh, and, um, you know, this, you guys know, these are why sleep is important, right? Because it's the time when our brains are consolidating memory. Um, there's immune regulation. We talk a lot about uh, um, plasticity and restorative therapy with sleep. Um, and then, you know, sleep deprivation, as we've seen, you know, we see commonly in our pediatric kids or in our pediatric neurology um, patients is that this sleep deprivation can lead to a, a whole host of things. Um, you know, some cognitive issues, uh, some mental health issues, uh, but weight problem as well. Um, and then, you know, in adolescence, we might see an increase in risk-taking behaviors. Uh, so some of the other co comorbidities that occur in other organ systems, um, so not uncommon, or, you know, not commonly, but uh, um, a relatively, you know, reasonable minority have mitral valve prolapse as a cardiac comorbidity. Um, some of them have inappropriate sinus tachycardia, which I mentioned earlier is another type of autonomic dysfunction. So rather than having an orthostatic cause of their heart rate jump, uh, they can actually have um, tachycardia just at rest, uh, greater than 100 beats per minute. Um, and this they uh, typically um, catch on prolonged monitoring. Um, so sire patch, filter, you know, that type of thing, um, then they will uh, catch the IST patients. Um, I mentioned we work with a GI specialist as well. Um, we see a lot of functional gastrointestinal disorders. Um, very commonly, nausea is an issue, which, you know, when I come down to the treatment section, is this is a big problem, the nausea and the, the constipation and bloating, because then they can't do the behavioral modifications necessary for treating POTS, which are increasing your fluid intake and increasing salt. I mentioned MCAS already, mast cell activation syndrome. Um, and so let's go to how we come up with the, the diagnosis. Um, so Obviously they have to have postural tachycardia and they have to have symptoms associated with the orthostatic change. They may also have these things. So modeling or duskiness or blue, bluishness of their extremities. Um, they typically have a lowish blood pressure when we see them, um, but not always. Some of them are the hyperadrenergic type. So they have elevated blood pressure. Oftentimes I see dilated pupils. Um, in terms of diagnosis, uh, you know, the, the best may be the passive tilted challenge rather than doing um, active standing. Uh, when you do active standing, you may not catch everybody. It's not as sensitive as uh, head up tilt because uh, when you stand up, your uh, muscles in your lower extremities contract and they may help you kind of um, return the blood back up, back to the heart. Now, on the other hand, that is the kind of physiologic normal, right? Nobody ever gets tilted up by, uh, um, and so that may not, we may not be catching, sorry, we may be catching too many people when we do the tilt table. Um, all our patients get EKG. Uh, we have an autonomic um, function test uh, that includes sweat. Um, some centers do maximal ex exercise testing. Uh, and then um, some of our patients will get gastric motility studies if they have GI symptoms. Um, so again, from Dr. Kretzberg Gregory's uh, paper in Handbook Clinical ne Neurology, um, there are, uh, he, here are the investigations he recommends for someone you suspect of having POTS um, and then why you would do those things. Um, 
so I like this table. Um, and Anna, if there's a way for me to leave slides with you or kind of put them in a box folder because they're probably very big, it's a big file. Um, okay, great. Um, then you guys can review because I know there's a lot of like information on these slides and I'm going kind of fast just so that we um, uh, finish up in the next 15 minutes. Um, so part of our autonomic function test um, includes uh, heart rate response to deep breathing. Um, and so in this patient, there's a mean heart rate difference of about 30 beats per minute. Um, and for this patient or for this, you know, normative, when we compared to normative data, that was, that was pretty normal for her. That was one of my concussion patients. Um, I mentioned here that, uh, you know, in the previous slide, um, these were the normal sweat response. Here's the abnormal sweat response in the foot. Um, in our patient, we had uh, no abnormalities in the pseudomotor axon reflex testing. Um, in Valsalva, uh, there was, the Valsalva ratio was above what was expected in this patient. Um, and then uh, here's just what tilt looks like. So in a POTS patient, um, and I was explaining, here's tilt compared to active standing. So you can see in active standing, you may not get that big jump that you do in the tilt table because you're recruiting the muscles in the lower half of your body to compress and then they constrict the vessels physically. Um, in our patient, this was her tilt and you can see we collect information um, with the symptoms at every couple of minutes, the, the tech will write down what the symptoms were that the uh, patient was reporting. Um, she had a systolic blood pressure drop, uh, but it was just 11. Um, and then, but she did have significant tachycardia. Um, and so she was up or almost 70 beats per minute uh, difference for her. Um, and you can see that here she goes from maybe about 80-ish uh, and she's up here around 150 and it's sustained up here until they return her back to supine position. Um, so the last part of uh, the talk is gonna be the treatment basically. Uh, we'll go over what the intervention um, should be. Um, and just to let you know, there really isn't a lot of data out there on what we should use. And it's a lot of symptomatic management. Uh, there. There was a consensus uh, paper put out in 2015, non-pharmacologic interventions should be tried first. So obviously you wanna discontinue meds that may worsen. And so uh, as pediatric neurologists, um, you, you know, or for me as a pediatric neurologist, I use amitriptyline quite a bit in my headache patients. As you guys know, amitriptyline increases heart rate. Uh, so in patients that I'm a little bit worried that have a flavor of, POTS or, you know, if they're post-concussive um, and they're describing some lightheadedness when they stand up, I may not start amitriptyline just because I worry that I'm going to exacerbate their condition. Um, so I might think about doing propranolol, but that's, I think, like the most common medication that we use um, that may worsen. Um, you know, uh, also, um, I don't know how much behavioral stuff you guys do, but you know, the ADHD meds obviously also um, can exacerbate heart rate. Then we recommend two to three liters of fluid. We recommend caffeine free um, and then salt intake. I have 10 to 12, 12 grams here, but I usually say about between five and 10. It's so hard to get to, to 10 even. Um, and what I recommend is, you know, get a kitchen scale, weigh out five grams of salt. I have them start with five and then just have them sprinkle it to their, um, on their food throughout the day. So, you know, put it in a little ramekin and that patient gets to use that amount of salt every day. Um, and I think patients are pretty surprised. That's quite a bit of salt. Um, I have a conversion I give them for, you know, if they're looking at packaging that has sodium content versus salt. Um, and then the other thing is that salt tabs, are pretty unpalatable. People really don't like them. Um, so oftentimes, you know, even though uh, salt tabs are available, we'd really much rather them do dietary salt intake. Um, there are things like liquid IV out there that have like, I think a gram of salt per like little package. And so I say, okay, yeah, it's totally fine to use that because then they're also getting the fluids in. Um, I emphasize that it's important to do the salt 
and the fluid because the salt, as you guys know, will hold the fluid in. Um, so I tell all my teams like you want to do the salt because that will keep your you know fluid volume up. Um, otherwise, the fluid just it doesn't by it on a, on its own you know really isn't going to help because you're just going to pee it all out. Uh, compression stockings, you know, in the summer here in LA, it gets to be hundred degrees. I have less than five patients of the, you know, 150 or so that I've seen that can actually wear compression stockings. Um, even well, it is cold today, but even just this week, it's been in the eighties, uh, which is, you know, pretty typical for living in the desert in California. So, um, so compression stockings, you know, hard, hard to convince your teams to wear compression stockings. The more you compress, I do tell them the more you compress, the better. So we want them to get waist high. Um, and some um, papers even suggest that abdominal binders are also very helpful. Again, hard to convince kids to, to do this. Um, and then regular exercise. And you want them to have a component of aerobic exercise as well as resistant tra resistance training. Um, and this can help increase the effect of circulatory volume. But it also, you know, if you, you're doing some strength training in your lower extremities, especially, you're building up the muscles. Those muscles will help to compress um, the vessels physically, which is what I, I tell my, my teens. Um, avoiding symptom exacerbation, obviously. So this is a list of some of the medications that we may use and why. Um, I think most commonly, uh, we'll start them on, whoa, sorry. I meant to, I was trying to, uh, we'll start them on beta blocker. And the reason is beta blocker can be helpful for the headache piece and can be helpful for the rapid heart rate. Um, you know, as you know, propranolol can increase fatigue at, at, you know, in some patients. And if they do have a component of hypotension, then it's not the best medication to start them with. Um, the best medication the cardiologists love to use is evabradine. I have another slide, which is next on what evaporidine does, but it reduces heart rate by <laughs> blocking the funny channel. Um, so this modulates sinus node pacemaker rate. And um, obviously one of the side effects could then be bradycardia, but that's what we're aiming for. Evaberdine was actually a drug that was approved for heart failure, but is not approved for the use in POTS. So we have to prescribe something else before we can go to evaberdine for it to be approved by, by insurance companies. Um, other things that we use, midodrine, especially if they have blood pressure kind of issues. So if they're on the lowish end to give them some blood pressure support, we might do midodrine. Um, we also do Flornef a little bit. I don't think we use this as commonly. Um, sometimes we'll do peritostigmine. Um, and then uh, a lot of times, so I've started using clonidine for, for some of the kind of hyperadrenergic features, especially if there's, you know, episodic anxiety, I might use it. Um, we, uh, we use it in patients that have trouble sleeping um, a lot. Uh, we try to stay away from the SNRIs, another medication that I often use for, for headaches or medication types that I often use for headaches. Um, so we'll try to go towards SSRI, which, you know, obviously not as effective in our headache patients. Um, I haven't put a lot of patients on erythromycin, and I don't typically use ciproheptidine even in my headache patients because it tends to make them slow and a little bit plumper. So, uh, but if uh, you know if there's a component of mast cell activation, I might use um, ciproheptidine for those patients. Um, another thing that I don't have on here is that uh, we've started in a few of our patients, the rheumatologist and I have started putting a few of our patients on um, low-dose naltrexone um, because uh, there seems to be some good effect for our patients with chronic pain. Um, so I mentioned the Vabradine, um, and uh, this is basically how it works, which I don't think we need to necessarily go over, but you can refer to this if you're, you're interested. I mentioned we use a multidisciplinary approach. Really, the goal is to return the patient to fully functional. Uh, most patients with POTS get somewhat better, can get somewhat better, but you, they are not cured of POTS. Um, POTS is a lifelong, I, I tell them usually, you know, POTS is a lifelong diagnosis. Um, you know, some of them get very much better and a lot of our mild cases do fairly well, um, even just with uh, non-pharmacologic treatment. So symptom management, sleep hygiene and exercise. I already mentioned why exercise was so important. Um, and then cognitive behavioral therapy. 
There are a few intensive pain rehabilitation programs in the country. Mayo, uh, Stanford has one um, that uh, patients have sometimes gone to before they even come to us. Um, as pediatric neurologists, it's very important. And I'm sure you guys know well, there is always a parent component. <laughs> um, sometimes it is that uh, they increase the sick role in pain behaviors. Uh, sometimes they exhibit solicitous behaviors to increase the anxiety. So they really like ask the kids about the pain all the time. So I have to tell them like, please don't ask your, your kid whether he's feeling unwell or, you know, she has a headache or she has a stomach ache or uh, he's very tired because I think then uh, it actually brings those, those symptoms out more. Uh, there's often a reduced expectation for them to do any of these things, chores, schoolwork, good emotional control. So they're allowed to uh, kind of start to be less functional. Um, so, right, I, I said this already, minimize attention to pain behaviors, I think is really important. Um, and then behavior management strategies uh, to motivate the child um, to utilize pain management strategies. Um, also, as you guys know already, missing school causes a real cascade of disability. Um, uh, we've seen this a lot, right, over the last two years with the pandemic that kids have been out of school, they have less adeptness at, at social skills, um, they're feeling isolated, they're getting uh, anxious. Um, if they're not in school, they aren't getting the same quality of education um, and uh, they might end up with despair. I mentioned the pandemic and, and I forgot to mention earlier that, you know, this might be also a timely talk for you guys because we've seen at least uh, five or six and we only have two POTS clinics a month. Um, so the most patients that we'd see in, in a month would be, I guess something like maybe 15. Um, and so we've seen at least five over the last several months that uh, were um, COVID uh, POTS. So long haulers from COVID, um, all teenagers so far. Uh, I mentioned already Mayo Clinic does have a pediatric pain rehabilitation center. It's an intensive inpatient or, you know, kind of inpatient type of um, program. It's multidisciplinary. Uh, they have, you know, psychologists, PTOT, oh, oh yeah, PTOT, recreational therapists. They engage in behavioral relaxation, biofeedback. Um, they do medication management, um, they treat uh, the comorbid psychiatric illness. So that's a good resource if you have patients that are really difficult to treat. Um, you know, the first thing is really to validate what the, the patient and the family is experiencing, be positive and optimistic about recovery. I do tell them that they, they, have, an, um, they have a possibility of getting better um, and that, you know, they can get significantly better if we can get them back to exercise. Um, so I said validating their symptoms and then giving a specific plan is really important as well. Uh, we use cognitive, oh, sorry. Um, in these pain uh, programs, they might use cognitive behavioral group therapy. I have a neuropsychologist that does cognitive behavioral therapy with our patients um, and also does cognitive restructuring when going back to exercise. Um, relaxation strategies are really important as well. Um, we do a lot of deep breathing uh, guidance. Um, I encourage biofeedback for these patients. Um, and then setting goals is very important. So this is where I use our occupational therapist. So our occupational therapist is trained in lifestyle redesign. So she was initially focused on working with our concussion patients. Um, we have a specialty concussion patient, uh, sorry, clinic that sees patients that have you know, typically are chronic symptom uh, or persistent post-concussive symptoms. Um, and so she helps them get back to school. She helps them organize themselves uh, for the day, get back to physical activity. So um, she does a lot of the goal setting for us. Um, oh, I mentioned, uh, I'm going to skip these because this is the concussion part and where I see right at 10 o'clock. Um, but we there has been some more published literature about uh, orthostatic intolerance and um, concussion. Um, I like this diagram uh, because um, it kind of gives, you know, what the symptoms are with POTS that we see commonly and um, what the purpose is of uh, 
of some of the activities and some of the side effects that might you might see that might make those activities hard here. Um, and I mentioned exercise already. I'm gonna let you guys do this on your own time, like look through these slides on your own time because I do have a lot of words on here. So I think you guys can figure this out and I wanna make sure not to keep you past in case you guys have clinic. Um, but uh, this is basically the reason and the recommendations for doing exercise to get back um, and uh, what your heart rate training zone should be um, for getting back to activity, which as I mentioned, is really the mainstay of treatment. Um, so we went over that POTS is multifactorial in etiology. Um, we mentioned, we talked about autonomic function testing that can be helpful to identify the type of autonomic dysfunction and that POTS requires a multidisciplinary approach to treatment. Um, and I do have some references um, in there that you guys can look at as well um, when you, if you review the slides. Oh, sorry, that was so fast and such a whirlwind, but I hope it's helpful um, for you guys with your clinic patients. That has been so helpful already. Oh my gosh, so much to think about. We did have one question from, I think this is Ayesh Gupta. He's one of our PGY2 uh, John neurology residents. Um, he says, is there a relationship between hearing loss or tinnitus and migraine and POTS? And is that in any way related to the occurrence of fibromyalgia in the future? Uh, so I'm not sure about that second question, which is the uh, fibromyalgia question in the relationship. I haven't tracked them and there are, as I mentioned, no longitudinal studies looking at, at that. Tinnitus is a um, not uncommon complaint that we see in our, our clinic um, and probably has to do with some part of, like my guess is that there, you know, over time as we study POTS a little bit more, we'll see that there is a, you know, neuropathy that maybe affects the cranial nerves as mm -hmm. well, and maybe related to the hearing loss there. Um, the tinnitus is probably a little bit mo more multifactorial. Um, Interesting. Yeah, I yeah, know he's on a rheumatology rotation. He says mm -hmm. that um, they've seen lots of kind of these hypermobile patients who have autonomic dysfunction or POTS that have tinnitus. So that's interesting. I don't think I've come across that at this point yet, but interesting. Yeah. Um, and then I see Amanda's question. We actually don't biopsy. So um, I haven't sent any of them for biopsy. So I just, you know, based on kind of their clinical description, um, you know, because it's so common to have a small, a small fiber neuropathy with POTS. Um, and, and really, uh, there isn't much that you would, that would change if you had that specific diagnosis, right? You're still treating them symptomatically. So sometimes I feel like less invasive is better because, you know, I still have to to manage whatever issue they're having, numbness, tingling, pain, um, even, even if they had a diagnosis. I, uh, I had a, kind of a, two different questions. Um, it's very interesting. We see a lot of these patients and sometimes we don't know what, what happens when they go somewhere else to like a POTS clinic and then they come back, you know, for me as a kind of much more junior child neurologist, I thought, thought it was just like send them to, I don't know, like Hogwarts or something. And then they come back and it's like, <laughs> now they have the diagnosis of POTS, you know? <laughs> um, so this is very helpful. Um, in terms of localization, it seems like it, a lot of what we're saying is hypothalamic, uh, autonomic, like the autonomic nuclei of the hypothalamus uh, having some form of dysfunction. And then I was wondering about, you know, if you could kind of reflect on what you've read in terms of, you know, where in the central nervous system uh, this localizes uh, in some cases or in the majority of cases? And then also, are there promising genes that kind of fill in that picture and, and make uh, the structure function relationship even more uh, likely? Like, is there a, a focal point? It's kind of a hard question. So that's one question. <laughs> and then um, the other one is basically, Gosh, let's just do one question. I don't want to do that to you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know if I can answer that question because, you know, there really isn't much literature looking at the central nervous system's role in POTS. That, that one kind of figure I showed you was like just, I think, the, the speculation about where, you know, some of that, uh, um, some of the psychological symptoms are coming from. 
uh, when you involve the amygdala, which is my colleague's favorite <laughs> part of the, the brain. Um, it, so, you know, and, and obviously must go, go through some relay stations. Um, I, we, the, I think the other issue with POTS that makes it really difficult is that it's so heterogeneous. Um, so when you talk about genes that are responsible, you know, there, there looks like there's a genetic, sorry, my dog's about to go out of my, hey! <laughs> uh, 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 Hannah, come yeah, back. Gotta regulate. Sorry. <laughs> oh no. My gardener is here and I forgot to shut the doggy door. Um, so, uh, <laughs> um, you know, I think we're, we're seeing, right, there is like likely a genetic component, right? There's likely some genes that are responsible because there are family members and there are some family members who have autoimmune things and then end up having, uh, you know, POTS or whatever. Um, but I think because it's heterogeneous, it's hard to identify any of the genes right now. Um, there may be things like uh, genetic EDS that um, will overlap with patients that have POTS because they have the EDS. Um, but I think it's it's similar to autism, right? There are probably hundreds of genes that mm -hmm. predispose you to having autism, just like there are probably hundreds of genes that predispose you to having POTS and that eventually subtypes will be characterized better. So like I mentioned earlier, there were the like neuro, there's like neuro POTS, high flow, and then there's the low flow POTS. And, um, and there are definitely people who are genetically predisposed, right? Like not everybody who gets COVID gets long haul COVID, but we don't know why you get long haul COVID. Not everybody who has a viral illness ends up getting POTS, right? Viral illnesses are like every, <laughs> every year, you know, as a pe pediatrician, you guys probably each get at least one viral illness each, each winter, mm -hmm. right? But, you know, most of you will not get POTS. So there's, there's some gene that's responsible. There's some, there are some genes that are responsible, but we don't, we don't know what those are. A lot of the studies are, are going to be focused on trying to identify those things, mm -hmm. but we don't even have like a consensus on how to treat people. And I think, again, that's because it's so heterogeneous genius of a disorder. So sorry, CJ, I totally no. did not answer your question you at did. all. You helped me frame it. And I, I kind of kind of segue off that into the next part, which is, so conversion disorder and functional movement disorders both have, you know, early, especially like a functional, like a seizure or something like that, you know, psychogenic non-epileptiform events, those often are rooted in some trauma, you not always, but I was wondering if you had compared the history of having either sexual or physical abuse in the past and the likelihood of having POTS versus a psychogenic non-epileptiform spell. And if you find that one is drastically lower or higher than the other, you know, if, if you've ever checked in on whether the history of trauma predicts you to get POTS or if it seems irrelevant. So this is something that's just come up over the last few months when I've talked to people. Uh, I think patients actually have brought this up is whether psychological drama can be a trigger for POTS. And I think although the literature is pointing to phys physical trauma or uh, deconditioning or um, uh, uh, sorry, illness, inflammatory response as being triggers, but has not, there has been no literature on the psychological trauma component. I'm certain that there is a role for psychological trauma because um, you're setting yourself up as kind of like uh, so, some people, right? Get set up as kind of like hyper stimulated, hyper aware, hyper, you know, like hyper vigilant. Those things, you know, if your body is in that state all the time, you probably can create a POTS like picture. Like over time, your body probably compensates with a POTS like picture. You know, it's poor compensate, poor compensation, but, but does that in response. Um, I think uh, the, uh, you know, so I, I also, because I'm a, a concussion specialist and even though I'm a pediatric neurologist, we take care of, um, the, we have a special program for vets at UCLA called Operation Mend. And so I take care of a lot of vets with, with um, the TBI and PTSD. And I also think about trauma, psychological trauma in the context of developing PTSD, because many of the vets I get, you know, we get voluminous records, like hundreds of pages of records. Almost every one of them has some kind of trauma in their history, 
Um, it might be physical, you know, physical abuse in their childhood, but sometimes it's sexual abuse. Uh, uh, you know, most of the women I've seen have military sexual trauma. So how does that set one up for PTSD, right? Because not everybody who experiences trauma ends up with PTSD. So there's some predisposition you get primed somehow is, is my guess. You get primed with the PT, uh, sorry, with the trauma. And then you're, then some people get PTSD. Some people get resilient, right? You guys have probably seen this is that, you know, some people out of trauma experience resiliency and we don't, we don't know why. Maybe there's a genetic reason for that as well. It's, it's hard to know. Um, in terms of uh, things like PNES, functional neurologic disorder. Interestingly, I don't see a lot of that in our POTS clinic. I do see a lot of F&D um, and, and probably the residents in my program would tell you that I'm the F&D expert because most of the kids that they triage <laughs> into clinic come to me. And I think they're just telling people I'm the F&D expert. Um, and that's because I think, you know, we see some of that after concussion. We, we see... I see, you know, a few cases of it, of it in pods. Um, and sometimes it's an exacerbation of something they're already experiencing, right? We see PNES in kids with epilepsy all the time, like regular epilepsy, right? You can have epilepsy, you can have seizure and you can have PNES. Um, that coexists many times. Um, so for whatever reason, their brain is set up to also have this kind of psychological um, lead derived kind of movement disorder or seizure or um, some of ours have weakness. Uh, I, don't, I don't exactly know where that's coming from. Um, you know, I think we're learning a lot more about psychiatric illness now, like a lot, you know, before, right? Before we had genes, <laughs> not before we had genes, but before we knew <laughs> anything about genes. Um, we didn't, we thought that psychiatric illness was something like more fuzzy, right? But we're seeing that a lot of psychiatric illnesses probably have, you know, I mean, they must have a biological basis that is genetically mediated, right? But we don't know what the genes are. And I think over time, we'll also come to know, oh, there are genes that predispose you to whatever, you know, like F and D, but it's also going to be heterogeneous, I think. Sorry, it's a lot of hand waving, but you know, as a neurologist, you have to get used to like a lot of hand waving because we don't know a lot about the brain. That's why I got into the job. <laughs> Me too. Um, sorry, I had one more question. Is there some time? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so um, I was like meaning to, I'm Irish by the way, sorry, I'm one of the rest in second year. I asked you that question earlier. But do you think patients who have like concussion and have a pre-existing hypermobility, are they more likely to develop POT symptoms or is there like a relationship that, and also uh, on that line, like the patients who are coming in their preteen years, like seven or eight years, um, who are having migraine symptoms, do they tend to develop more of POTS when they reach their teenage years? Is that something that you're seeing? I've seen a couple, so I can only give you based on my like anecdotal experience. I have taken care of a few preteen migraine patients that I start to feel like, oh, you're going to be potsy. And then I send them over to our POTS clinic, but I, I have seen them and I can't identify why those are. Like, I can't figure out, you know, what, what makes you a POTS patient or not. Um, I... One of them is a dancer. Uh, I have a lot of dancers in POTS clinic. You can imagine that's because they're hypermobile. Um, and so in terms of concussion and hypermobility, uh, you know, we don't do, because my concussion clinic is a different multidisciplinary clinic. I don't have room that does, you know, like the uh, bite and scores, the EDS evaluations and things like that. So um, I am not certain. I don't have, I would have to look uh, in our concussion database to, to figure that out. But it's a good thing to, to think about because then we might be able to identify a, a certain um, population that would require different treatment. And actually we have, a, a we were just awarded a big U grant, a U54 
um, called care, we call it care for kids. Um, and it's looking at endophenotypes of uh, patients, adolescents with persistent post-concussive symptoms. Um, so looking at, you know, here's a migraine phenotype, here's a, you know, like here's the autonomic dysfunction phenotype, here's the, uh, you know, vestibular phenotype. Um, and so maybe in a few years, I'll, I'll have an answer for that or more of an answer. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much again, Dr. Joe. This was like such a fascinating talk and I think you've challenged us all to do a better <laughs> job with our POTS patients, honestly. I mean, they can be challenging and we, I think need to, I, you've given me a lot to think about at least. You know, I think there's some areas where we're not really uh, maximizing our therapy, especially non-therapeutically. So. Well, and it's hard because if you don't have it in a multidisciplinary setting, yeah. you don't have that ability before it would be like, oh, it would take me, you know, like two weeks to talk to room and another two weeks to talk to GI. And, you know, that way, if we're all in the room together and, you know, sometimes it's on zoom, but we have a big text group, you know, group mm -hmm. text going, we can make decisions right away. That's way more helpful for the patient. Um, and then I'm just really lucky because my concussion program has a lot of resources. So I can borrow my OTs and my dietitian to work on the GI stuff. And, um, and I have a neuropsychologist. So if I want to do a quick cognitive screen, I can do those, you know, to help with the brain fog accommodations and school and things like that. So I, it's just a matter of finding where your resources are and establishing a relationship with those people so that you can quickly refer over to those people if you need to. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks oh, for inviting thank you, me. Thank Anna. you so much. Yeah. And the slides are, would be amazing. I think all of the residents, especially, but the faculty as well, would love to have this as a resource. Um, so yeah, if you're willing to, I think just trying to email it to me and I can put it on our drive. Um, if you think it'll send. I don't think it'll send, but I'll, I'll maybe okay. put it in my box uh, account and then like invite you to share in my okay. box account and then you that can download great. it and put it on your drive. Perfect. I'll do that Thanks. later today. I'm going to sure. run and ride my pony. Yes. Have fun riding. <laughs> yeah. Thank awesome. you. Well, Thanks thank you, you so much again. Nice meeting you. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Bye. Bye everybody. Bye.